Welcome to Living Word Pretoria East. Whether you are new, familiar, or just here for the coffee, you are all a part of this family. You are so welcome here. Due to COVID-19 regulations, we have a seat restriction of 50 people per in-person service. To ensure that you get a place, please make sure that you book a seat through our Eventbrite profile. Our trusty pastors or your cell leaders will send a link to you via our various groups. Remember that our in-person services take place every second week at 9 and 11.15. Come around or be square. Hi, church family. I just want to invite you guys to our Bible study Monday evenings on YouTube and on Facebook where we go into the Word of God and we study what was going on in the circumstances when the Bible was written and how it affects what was written at that specific time and how does that impact us as a Christian today and how we can apply that in our daily walk with our Christian life. So join us on Monday evenings our Bible study is one of the ways where we at Living Word Pretoria East want to equip you and form you to function in the calling that God has got for you. So Monday evenings, see you online. Be blessed. We would like to thank you for your continued generosity. This is why we have come up with ways to make it even more easy and convenient for you to give as the Lord leads you. SnapScan. You can find our SnapScan barcodes on one of the chairs in front of you. If you're in church right now, have a look. And if you're watching online, it should appear at the bottom of the screen during the giving message. WhatsApp Give. Where giving is as easy as sending a text. Or you could do it the old-fashioned way by making an electronic payment into our bank account. For more information, visit our social media pages at Living Word Pretoria East. Thank you for joining this service, and may this message really bless you. Living Word Pretoria East, you're formed to function. Good morning, friends, family. I want to welcome you to the service this morning. What a privilege to be able to spend some time on the Word of God. And that sanctifies, that sets apart, that brings new life. The Word says, this is a new day that the Lord has made. Let us, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I pray that you will rejoice in this day. May you experience God, God's joy that brings new strength. And, and thank you for being with us this morning. As part of our worship, we're going to give. And I want to just share... A short message that's on my heart and we're going to read from the book of Genesis 4 uh, verse 3 to 7 so if you have your Bibles you're welcome to page with me there I'm going to start in Genesis 4 verse 3 it says the following in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat and their fat portions and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you dwell, will you not be accepted? And if you do not dwell, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And I'll just touch on, on two things here. See, this was... A very unique time in, in the Word of God. We see the two first sons entering the earth, and, and I really believe that resources, um, we had resources in abundance, scarcity, there was no scarcity, and even in this place of abundance, uh, these two sons, Cain, Cain and Abel, they, they offer something to God, and, and it's very clear that the Bible says that, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and the Lord had regard for Abel. And his offering. And if we look at the original Hebrew of this text, it actually means sha'a, which means he viewed it as something pleasant. He gazed upon it. And it stirred my heart and I said, Lord, but is it possible for us to give you something that you gaze upon, that you really view as something special? And why is this so different? And 
Lord, just took me to Hebrews 11, verse 4 in the, New, in the New Testament. You can page there. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gift. And through his faith, though he died, it still speaks. And I've just realized somehow that the word says, even though it is received by mortal men, we give unto him who remains forever. And my heart this morning for you is that you will get to a place of revelation. When, when you give, we give out of, a, out of faith, but we give because of our love for God and our love of God, but also our love for God's kingdom. My heart is that, that, that your love for God will give birth to your place of giving, that your love for His kingdom, for His word, for His ministry will be the place that gives birth to your giving and to your sowing, but also that your giving will be from a place of faith, because the word says it's by faith that He gave a more acceptable gift, by faith. And the word says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I pray that you will really open your heart to receive this message this morning, that you will spend time in the Word of God to understand what it means to give by faith and to give by love and the expectation that goes with it. And I pray that even in the season when you give, the gifts that you give will be acceptable unto our Father. I want to just leave you with a quote this morning. Uh, someone wrote the following. It says, If you want to be discouraged and disappointed, place your confidence in yourself and your expectations in other people rather than God. And my prayer this morning is that we will not place confidence in ourselves, that we will not place our expectations in people, but we will trust in Him. The Word says that He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the one that provides. I pray that you will really take this message and, and make it your own and place what you have in God and in His Word because He is faithful. Amen. We're just going to pray together this morning. And if you've got seed ready, I want you just to hold your seed in your hand. If, you, if you're going to, before you tell them whatever platform you use, but I want you just for a second to just become aware of the fact that you're going to give and how holy this moment is unto God and why we can, can give something that is acceptable unto Him. Father, I want to thank You for this beautiful day. I want to thank You, Holy Spirit, for Your presence and for the ability that we have just to spend some time with you this morning. Lord, I want to pray for every person that's listening to this message that is about to give. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless that seed. I thank you, Lord, that the fruit is, the, 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 the ground is ready to receive the seed. And I thank you, Lord, for a harvest that is about to multiply for your glory. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that by faith we can give a more acceptable give unto you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you will come and stir our hearts that we can give in faith, given the expectation, Lord, give because of our love for you, our love for your kingdom. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will guide us in this moment, that you will guide us in this season. Father, we don't want to place our expectations and our confidence in ourselves and in people and in, and in structures, but we want to place it in you, in your word. Father, I pray that, that you will guide us this morning. We just want to declare that we give because we love you, we honor you. Father, we know that you are Jehovah Jireh, you are the provider, and I thank you that you will provide for every need in every season in this time, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will open our hearts this morning to receive the word. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, and thank you that we can declare this morning that we love you. We love you, we want to glorify your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Good morning, family. Wonderful to gather together again, again for the Word of God. And, and if you tune in via Facebook Live or, or YouTube Live, I just want to bless you. I want to welcome you to the service. If you're new for the first time today, may you enjoy it with us and may the Word bless you. And I believe that the Word for today is really a, a relevant word for, for this season and for this time. So let's just pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that it will bless hearts, that it will bring revelation, that it will bring breakthrough, and that it will do a mighty work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So my title for this morning is, When You Can't See God Working. When you can't see God working. I mean, we all need miracles in our lives. We need breakthroughs. We're trusting God. We're having our faith out there. And we really need God to perform, to, to, to come through for us, to do something. But it's as if you just cannot see God working. It doesn't seem that He's anywhere. 
And you maybe have all these questions that, why cannot I see God working? And we're going to look at the life of people who had the same scenario, and they were forced to seeing the invisible God. They didn't look at circumstances. They had to look at what they cannot see, seeing the invisible. So what do we do when you can't see God working in your life? So let's look together. We're going to mainly look at the book of Exodus chapter 2, and it centers around the life of four prominent Israelites in the time of Exodus. And we're going to look at their lives, and, and I'm sure you heard of them. I mean, it's hugely influential people. First of all, we, we have good old Shifra. Shifra, I mean, that it's a famous Israelite woman. Okay, maybe, maybe you haven't heard of her. Maybe you haven't heard that name, but maybe what about her famous sidekick, Pua? Have you heard about her? Not? Okay, maybe how, how about the faith of Jochebed? Still doesn't ring a bell? No, no light? Let's see. Maybe the last guy you know. How about Moses? I'm sure you know Moses. All right, we all know Moses. But these are four people that we're going to have a look at because they were hugely influential in that time and in that season, seeing when God doesn't seem to work, they cannot see God working, they saw something different. So, so they were at a place in their lives where, where they had, because of difficulties commanded by Pharaoh of Egypt, they were forced to see the invisible. They were forced not to look in the natural, but they were forced to see in the supernatural, to see the invisible God working. Now, invisible, just in plain words, means that you cannot see it. It's invisible. I mean, as children, how many times did we wish to, to play and we imagine that, you know, we become invisible and, and you cannot see us. But still today, in our lives, it sometimes feel like, man, God's just invisible. We cannot even see God. So, invisible means that you cannot see it. So let's just go through a few scriptures, and I want you to see first the background of these scriptures before we go into our text, that you can get a reference of, of what we're going to talk about. So invisible is not being able to see. Now, the book of John 1 verse 18 says that no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God, and, and Romans 1.20 speaks of being invisible. He says, he's, for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made so that they are without excuse. It speaks about His invisible attrib attributes, His character. 2 Corinthians 4.18 speaks of this. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Not what you can see, but what is unseen. And I mean, it's very interesting that the Bible comes and it says that you need to fix your eyes. That what you see with, eyes see. I mean, I see with my eyes. And he says that you need to fix that what you see with on that what is not seen. I mean, come on, you know, the, the, fix your eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. You know, how, how weird can we get? And, and it says, but, but we have to do that to, to get breakthrough and to understand this key. There's this powerful victory and breakthrough in seeing the invisible, in seeing the invisible. Colossians 1.15, the book speaks of Jesus, and it says that He is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God looks like, we can look at the life of Jesus because it says, for He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And then Hebrews 11:27 speaks of this. It says, By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He preserved or persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, it gets interesting. It starts talking about a person. He saw him who is invisible. Colossians 1:15 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So it's, talk, it, it's talking about a person. Isaiah 45, 15 speaks of this. It says, Truly, you are a God who hides Himself. O God of Israel, the Savior. So it speaks of a Savior, and it says, You are a God who hides yourself. You cannot see Him. It's invisible. Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, For in this hope we were saved. No hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Amen. You don't hope for what you can see. You wait for it with patience. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, that we walk by faith and not by sight. 
So we walk by faith, not what we can see, not, not what we can see in the natural. It's seeing the invisible. It's seeing the unseen. What do you do when it seems like God is doing nothing? You need to get it to a place in your life where you can be able to see the invisible, see the unseen. That's what faith is. It says we, we, don't walk, by, we walk by faith, not by sight, what we see. And Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Not seen. It's not what I see. It's to see the unseen. And he continues in, in Hebrews 11, verse 24 to 27. It says that by faith, we're going to look at his life now. When he, when, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Remember that. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He saw him who is invisible. He had an encounter with God. He saw him who was invisible. And, and as humans, as believers, we are forced to a constant need to see and trust in the invisible. We need to trust and see that which is unseen. And this applies from the day you were saved until the day you finished the race. You're going to have to trust that what is invisible, that what is unseen. So reading the scriptures above us and, and, and the, the scriptures of the Exodus passage that we're going to read now, I want you to, to put yourself into their situation. Just imagine noting how things would have been for them that when you look at the natural. I mean, looking at the natural in circumstances, and we're going to look at the stories of what they went through, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. What was the natural situation looking like? And then they were forced, they had to, to have faith in seeing the unseen. So put yourselves in their shoes this morning and their natural circumstances and then also in their shoes where they had to put their faith in seeing the unseen. All right, so let's look at our first, um, the case of God-fearing midwives, Shifra and Pua. In Exodus 1 verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, When you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them in the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not want uh, to do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. And they let the boys live. So one of the first things that, that you need to realize or that needs to be stressed is the need for a healthy fear of the Lord, a fear of God, that, that, that we need the fear of the Lord in our lives. And it's essential for us to live as Christians in a world that, that is ignorant and opposed to the true God. This was the same scenario that the Israelites had in, in the land of Egypt, that they, had, they were in a country that, that were opposed and ignorant of the true God. I mean, in, and, and it was essential for them to trust God. To, we have this classic scenario, this scene where, where the king of Egypt was worshipped by the Egyptians as a god. They worshipped him as, as he is God. And it tells the story of the two Israelite midwives. They were instructed by the king, by Pharaoh, to do the unthinkable. They were instructed by him that when the ladies of, 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 of the Jewish nation, when they give birth and it's a boy, they were commanded by the king to kill these baby boys. They had to kill them. And we read that, that Shifra and Pua, they feared God and they did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do. They did not do what, what, what he, he commanded them to do. Now, they did not do what the king commanded because they feared God. It's, it's easy to read the sentence. It's easy to, to write the sentence. But surely for them, it's, it, it wasn't easy to do. I mean, just how easy can you tell this? You know, they feared God and they didn't do what the king told them to do. It's easy to tell it, but when you have to do it, it's not just that easy, plain, simple way of, of following it. It's, it's challenging. And, 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 I, and if you put yourself in, in their shoes for a second, what could they see in the natural? What did their circumstances look like in the natural? I mean, they could see an angry pharaoh. 
who was in complete control of the entire Egyptian nation, and for some reason or another, he, he wasn't very fond of the Jewish nation. He wasn't fond of, of the Jews, and, and, and they see what happens when people deliberately choose to disobey or go against what Pharaoh said. Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh himself called these midwives. He spoken to these women in person, and he commanded them to kill the baby boys. So disobedience meant for them certain death. They will die if they disobey the king. Now, if you look at their lives, you know, and you look at their picture in the natural, it was a dark picture. It was gray and dull. It, it wasn't a good picture. They didn't see a clear picture. And yet, despite how things looked outwardly, they were brave not to, to look at the things that they can see with the natural eye, but they looked to Him who is not seen. They fixed their eyes on Him who is invisible. They saw the unseen. And, and through their fear of God, because they honored God, they feared God, they choose. It's always a choice. You always have a choice in your life. They choose to do instead what's pleasing to God and not to do what the king has commanded them. Let's continue reading. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before all the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families of their own. I just, I just love it that, that they are summoned before the king, and they just have this godly wisdom in, in how to answer him and say, but hey, our Israelite women, they're not the same as your Egyptian women. They're strong, they're vigorous, and they give birth even before we arrive. Godly wisdom in, in how to handle this. You see, having disobeyed the king, these two midwives, courageous midwives, they summoned to, to Pharaoh's throne to explain their actions, why, why they have done this, you know. And, and, and my question is, how scared would they be? How, how scared would have they been to, to go there? knowing that, that they deliberately disobeyed a king's command. And again, if you look at the things or the picture in the natural, it's a dark picture. It's not something that, that looks great. It, it's, it's dull and it's, it's morbid. And all these two ladies had to go on was their faith in the unseen God. That's all they had. They, they put their faith and their trust in that which were unseen, in a God who is invisible. And, and the question is this, would fearing God, would, would putting His will to trust Him, to, will, it, will it pay off? Will it pay off in the end to put His will first and to be God-fearing? Will it pay off? And evidently, if, if we look at it, it says yes. It did for sure. It, we read that it says that God was kind to the midwives because the midwives feared God. He gave them families of their own. 1 Samuel 2, 30, 30 says this, that, that God honors those who honor Him. God honors those who honor Him. And, and it's like a fountain of life that's available to those that fear God. So, so these two midwives feared God, choose to put their trust in that which is unseen, to the God who is invisible, and God came through for them. The next character we're looking at is Jochebed. Jochebed saw also the invisible. The transition after the midwives that didn't work, Pharaoh had a, another evil plan. Exodus 1, 22 into Exodus 2, up into verse 4. It says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. I mean, things just got worse because God looked after the midwives and, and he came through for them, but this whole episode just got up to Pharaoh's nose. I mean, he just got fed up and he, he, he contemplated, he, he, he 
He got a new plan. He says, hey, now the order is not given to you as midwives to kill baby boys. Now this order is given to all of the Egyptians. If there's a baby boy that is born, you have to throw him into the Nile. You have to kill all Jewish baby, boy, baby boys. I mean, things doesn't again look good. This is a dark gray picture. This is, it's not looking good in the natural, uh, you know, if you go by what you see, everything looks grim. It's, it's, it's a bad atmosphere. And Moses' parents, Amram and, and Jochebed, I mean, they should be, be beside themselves. Obviously, they, they stay close to the Nile River, and they see what happens to all the other babies, that they are being thrown into the, into the Nile. And yet we read this in, in Hebrews 11.23. It speaks of Moses' parents. It says that by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. By faith. Because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You see, faith makes seeing the invisible possible. By faith, they were hiding Moses. Faith makes seeing the invisible possible. Amen? In other words, that, that though everything around them looked dull and grim and terrible, Moses' parents chose to keep their eyes and their faith in the invisible, in seeing the unseen, looking at the God who is invisible and looking at Him. And their faith dispelled their fear and, and what they actually had to feel and, and worries and all these things that, that naturally occurs in a situation like this. That actually cast it out and dispelled that fear. And they chose not to fear the king, but they chose to fix their eyes on the unseen. They chose to fix and keep their eyes in the invisible God. So that was powerful. And now here, because they've done that, here's the workings of the invisible God. Exodus 2 from verse 3 to 10. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tarn pitch. And then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bath, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent her slave girl, to go and get it. And she opened it, and she saw the Hebrew baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went to get the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became a son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So, let me just ask you this question. Having read these verses now with me, where is God mentioned in all of this? Where is God mentioned in all of this? Never, not even once. Nowhere is he mentioned, yet he's found everywhere. And that's what I want you to look at your life. Maybe he's not mentioned anywhere here, but he's found everywhere. But before we look at that, let's just look at what it would have been like for, for Moses' parents, what they felt like. I mean, you see, they, they chose to, to hide Moses, to hide him for as long as possible. But you see, this boy is growing and, and he's getting strong lungs and, lungs and, and, and you know, he's, he's going to cry and, and it's not for long. It's just a matter of time before he's going to be discovered. So, so they make a decision to, to put him into a basket and to push him out into the Nile. And, and I want you to see, just can you imagine how Jochebed, uh, Moses' mother, how, how she would have felt? Just imagine if, if you, you, there's an edict from the king that, Baby boys needs to be thrown into the Nile to be killed. And, 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 and now you need to push your baby boy. That's the only chance of survival to push him out on the Nile in a basket. And just ima uh, imagine how she felt. There's no sign of God, not a peep of him. I mean, she doesn't see him. Yet she needs to die to her own ability where she's able to care and protect for Moses. 
and, and they, they, the only faith that she's got is the faith that she has in the invisible God, that she needs to put her faith, and, and this faith to put Moses in a basket, you know, dying to her old self and, 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 and what she's capable of doing. While she pushes Moses out, she says, like, God, I'm, I'm just trusting you. I'm letting go of, of my own ability now to protect Moses, and I, I place him into your hands. Please now, you take the consequences. She didn't have any control anymore. Her picture looked gray and dim. She was at the end of her possibilities, and she says, God, I place him into your hands now. That's, that's what I need to do because I cannot control anything. And she put her faith in the unseen. She put her faith in an invisible, invisible God. And the question is maybe this, so, so where was God? Where is God? Will He come through for her? Will He come through? And, and, and this is the question that I want to stand still for a moment for you today. I bet in your life you've been at this same place, at this crossroad, you've been at this same place in your life before where you say, but where is God? Where is God that I do not see Him in my life, I do not see Him in my circumstances. Would He come through for me? You know, I find myself that I have to place, also not like Moses, I have to place myself, I have to, to place my job, my, my circumstances, my family, my marriage, my children, my future, whatever. I have to place that into your hands. And will He come through for you? I know that, that you have been, or maybe you're at that place in this moment, to say, but I'm here and, and I've got no other choice because my picture is dim and it's gray and it's dark and it's dull. I don't see in the natural a clear picture. I don't see any possibilities. And the only thing that I can do is to put my faith in the invisible, invisible God, to put my faith to see the unseen, to see that which is not seen. And here's the great news that I want to share you. I want to encourage you this, this day is that though we do not see Him and, and though we, sometimes we don't hear Him, He's always working. Amen? Though you don't see Him and though you don't hear Him, He's always working. When you can't see God working, He is still working. That's, that's the words of Jesus. John 5, 17, Jesus says, but Jesus answered him, My Father is working until now and I am working. Jesus gives this promise. He says that, that God is working. He is working. The Father is working. And although you don't see God working, God is working. Maybe you don't see it because you don't see the unseen. You're looking with the natural eyes. You're looking for, for that what is in plain sight. But God says we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Amen. And faith makes seeing the impossible possible. It makes seeing the invisible possible possible. Amen. And that's what God wants. It's faith that is pleasing unto Him. And, and maybe it's a time where you need to look and see how your faith becomes pleasing to Him by seeing the unseen, by seeing the invisible. Look at how it worked out here. I mean, was it simply coincidence that, that Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile on that very day that Moses was placed in a basket? No. Do you think it's coincidence that, that Pharaoh's daughter came down to the exact place than where Moses was placed. No, I don't think so. I, I know it was God. God orchestrates these things. God is in control. The Word says that God's not found asleep. He's not asleep. He's, he's watching. He's ready to watch over His Word and ready to perform it. You know, Pharaoh's daughter would have no idea that, that she was being used in the plan of God. Yes, and used she was. She was used in the plan of God. I mean, it was God that allowed her heart to be filled with pity for Moses. He made her heart soft. It, it was God that arranged for, for Jochebed to look after her own son, to be able to raise and nurture him. It, it was definitely God that allowed her to be paid for what she's doing. I mean, being paid to take care of your own child, that's, that's wonderful. You know, that was God's doing seeing the unseen, and, and, and although God is not seen or not heard in this passage, I mean, this passage speaks and testifies of the invisible God who works. Amen? And I want you to, to stand still at your life and see this, that although He's not seen and although maybe He's not heard, your life is filled 
with, 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 with passages filled that speaks and testifies of an invisible God that works. Romans 8.28 says that, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. I mean, you, you just need to, to get quiet and start realizing and, and, and become aware of how God works. And that God is actually always there, that He's never been distracted, He's never been withdrawn, but He's always been working. And, and Moses, in the same way, had an encounter with Him and He saw Him who is unseen. Exodus 2 from verse 11 to 15. One day after Moses had grown up, He went out to where His own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And He saw an Egyptian beating on a Hebrew one of his own people. Glancing this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And the next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What? I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian. I mean, just, just imagine Moses were raised in, in the palace, in, in Pharaoh's courts. And just imagine what it would have been like to grow up as Pharaoh's son. I mean, it, it goes without thinking that he have had all the power and the pleasure and the money and the wisdom that this world could offer. He had everything that that world at that time could offer. And, and very little, actually nothing is said in Exodus and on Moses' upbringing under Pharaoh, what it was like. But Stephen, the deacon Stephen, in his speech to the Sanhedrin in, in Acts 7, we get a glimpse of, of the upbringing of Moses. He's, he speaks and he says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and in action. I mean, he was powerful in speech and action. He was, he was a royal prince. Moses had everything he could have ever wanted. He had everything, everything except God and the peace that comes with knowing that you have a close, intimate relationship with God. He had everything except God and the peace of knowing that he stands in a right relationship with God. Do you have God? Do you have peace knowing that you stand in the right relationship with God? It continues, it says that by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. I mean, this is, this is so amazing. Just think of, of what he gave up. I mean, he associated himself with the Hebrews, with his own people. It cost him a future, an aspiration of becoming a leader of Egypt. I mean, he gave up his comfort and his pleasures and his pride and prestige. He chose to, to identify and associate himself, he says, with his own people. It was, a, it was a huge cost to pay, but he was willing because it says that he looked ahead to, 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 to his reward. He looked ahead to his reward. In other words, Moses could see the unseen. Moses could see the unseen, and, and he saw eternity and the overwhelming importance of of eternal rewards compared to just temporary rewards. He saw that which were for eternity. And we are called to do the same. We are called, what is the unseen in your life that you need to see? My question, what is the unseen in your life that you need to see? If we left with, with any doubt why Moses did what he did, the book of Hebrews says this, Hebrews eleven twenty seven, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Man, he saw him. He saw God. He saw him who is invisible. And this changed everything. He saw. He had an encounter. Colossians 1.15. And Jesus, he is the image 
of the invisible God. He saw Him who is invisible and He changed everything. This was just a short review of Shifra and Pua and Jochebed and Moses. But I mean, they were great people of God due to the simple fact that they were able to see the invisible God. They were able, in the midst of, of very trying circumstances, in the midst of, of where things in the natural didn't look great, where the things in the natural actually just were a downward spiral, they couldn't see. They chose to see the unseen, to, to put their faith in the invisible God. They were able to see that. And, and for us too, our need three and a half thousand years later is still to do the same. God, God hasn't changed. I mean, God works and, and the way that God works hasn't changed. The way God delivers hasn't changed. God's the same yesterday, today, forever. And, and whatever you are currently faced with, I want to tell you, the command of the New Testament, like that of the Old, says this, fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Fix your eyes, that what you see with, not on that what you can see, but fix your eyes what you see with, and that what is unseen. May you see the invisible God. Let's just look at a, at a New Testament story. In, in the book of John 11, verse 3, the report comes, he says, Lord, the one that you love is sick. That's the message that, that Jesus' friends bring to him. Lazarus, your friend, is clinging to life. He's busy dying. And the message comes from, from Lazarus' sisters, uh, Mary and Martha. But Jesus didn't seem to be troubled. I mean, as a matter of fact, he, he declared this. He says that this sickness will not end in death. He says that not this is for the glory of God, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And then Jesus does the unexpected. He, do, he does this, nothing. He does nothing. He actually, he stays for two more days exactly where he is. He stays and, 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 and he does nothing while Lazarus is busy dying. I mean, he, he healed so many people before. He touched so many. Why didn't he immediately go to Lazarus to, to touch him and make him well? How could he just sit there and, and do nothing? I mean, don't you hate it when God doesn't do what you think He should? Yeah. I'm sure that, that most of us, at, at one time or another in our lives, we had a situation where we thought, how could God have allowed this? How could God allow this to happen? How could God just stand by and watch? This is exactly how, how Martha and Mary felt what they were thinking. They were thinking this when Jesus finally arrived four days after Lazarus', Lazarus death. They thought, man, you know, his, both his sisters questioned Jesus and says that, Lord, if, if you had been here, my brother would have lived. He wouldn't die. He would have lived. You know, in, in their hearts, they were full of disappointment with God. Jesus had healed so many others. Why not his own friend? Why not healing him? I mean, how could, how could Jesus allow him to die? They, the sisters loved Jesus. They believed in Him. But they were confused by His lack of action. And Jesus tells Martha this. He says in John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even though He dies. And whoever lives and believes in Me will never die. I mean, this quote of Jesus is some of the cornerstone foundations of our theology and our doctrine. But good doctrine and theology helped nothing in their disappointing confusion to fade away by this grief that they had. Nothing. And then Jesus, the, the resurrection and the life, He stepped up to the tomb and, and He called Lazarus forth from the realm of the dead. And when Jesus did that with the statement that says, I am the resurrection and the life, along with the power to, to raise Lazarus from the dead, I mean... Everything that the Bible has to say about heaven and hell and eternal life and the promises of eternal life is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. If you can see that, He holds eternity in His hands. When He says that I am the resurrection and the life, everything containing that, He holds in His hands. And today He tells you as well, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. If you hold on to me, you will have life. 
He's the only one that should be trusted with your eternity. And, and raising Lazarus out of the dead teaches us something else, that when God seems to be doing nothing, He may be doing much more than you can ever imagine. When God seems to be nowhere to be found, that He's not working, that He's doing nothing, it seems or, 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 He may be doing so much more than what you can ever imagine. You know, Jesus declared that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God. And Jesus knew that, that he will be totally glorified by the situation at hand. And, and when Lazarus died, Jesus was just getting started. He used Lazarus' situation to bring utmost glory to the Father. He didn't do what we're expecting of him to, to go and heal Lazarus. No, he did something better. I know that there will be times in future where, where God doesn't do what I expect. I know that we're all going to be in that scenario, in that place where God doesn't do what we expect that He should do or what we think that He should do. But I know in every situation that, that He can and will bring greater glory to Himself. Amen? And if He doesn't do what I think that He should do, you know, it's very probable that God is actually doing something much better. He's got something much greater in mind than what we want Him to do right now. I've got a question that, are you dealing with disappointment right now? Are you dealing with, with, with things that God acted in a way that, that would not have expected, that you didn't expect, that you felt, but why didn't God come through? Why didn't God come and just meet my needs? Why didn't He do this? Are, are you dealing with that disappointment? Again, I want to say Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. He's the resurrection and He can breathe life into any situation that you're dealing with. The wonderful reality is this, that, that God is usually doing a thousand things when it looks like He's up to nothing. He's usually doing a thousand things when it doesn't seem that He's working. I mean, just think about Joseph when he sat in prison and it, it, it appeared that God wasn't working. God was doing a thousand things behind the scenes. I mean, he felt forgotten and, and abandoned and discarded and, and maybe he felt useless. But God was actually, in the meanwhile, He was doing a thousand things. God was preparing the hearts of His brothers for reconciliation. God was busy preparing Pharaoh to receive Joseph, Joseph as of God. God was preparing the nation of Egypt to be able to trust and depend on Joseph and, and to be a wise steward of the food. God was working behind the scenes. Let's just look at, at John Bynan. You know, he sat in prison. And, and, and he felt that God wasn't doing anything. But whilst he was sitting in prison and he felt like my ministry is being hamstringed and hampered and, 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 and I cannot, I'm a preacher of the gospel, I mean, but I'm not able to preach the gospel. Meanwhile, God was doing a thousand things behind the scene when he sat in his prison cell. God was, was preparing Biden to write a book that, that will be read by millions of Christians and, and revolutionize their love for God. That prison cell was, was the womb, was the birthplace for the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. That was a place. And just because you cannot see God working doesn't mean God is not working. God is doing a thousand things when it seems like He's doing nothing. And I know it's a relevant word for this time and for this season. And this is my prayer that look at your life circumstances, look at your life, your workplace or your family or your relationships or, or whatever you're trusting God for. In this time and in this season, may you see the invisible God. May you be able to see the unseen. May you live a life that, that look forward to the greater reward. Amen. May you have faith and trust God to do the unseen while everything that you see or, or see seems dark and gray. Don't look. I want to challenge you. Again, get to this place that don't look at the natural. Don't look at what you see right in front of you. Look, see. May you see the invisible God. May you see the unseen. I mean, God is the invisible, unseen God. And just because we cannot see Him does not mean He's not working. Amen. May your faith be pleasing to the Lord. May you persevere and like Moses, may you saw Him who is invisible. May you have an encounter with Jesus who is the image of the invisible God. I really pray that, that God will shift and change your eyes to, to shift from the natural to see what's in the natural 
into having faith in the unseen God, in that which is not being able to see, and knowing that if it doesn't seem like God is working, if it seems like God is far off, know that God is working behind the scenes, that everything worked together for the good for those who love the Lord. God will come through for you. I know because God loves you, God's got a plan, a destiny, a future for you. And therefore, He will not leave nor forsake you. Keep on. Don't see the natural. See the impossible. See the invisible. See the unseen. Amen. Let's just pray together. Father, thank you, Lord, for this word. And I know that this word is relevant. This word is so relevant in, in this time and season when we look at circumstances and, and the workplace and, and what's going on in the country and what's going on in the world, in nations. Father, that we could feel uncertain. We can feel threatened. We can feel that there's no hope, there's no future, that it's a dark and grim and dull picture. But Father, we know you, you've called us not to, to walk by what we see, but to walk with faith. And we see that faith is seeing the unseen. Faith is what's making that what we could not see possible. So Father, stir up a new level of faith in us. Father, I pray that we will fix our eyes on Jesus, the image of the invisible God, and that we will be able to see into this supernatural, to see the invisible, to see the unseen. I bless you. Father, I bless each and every one that listens this word to, to have their eyes open to have not just God, but to have the peace that goes with having the right relationship with God, to have a peace that goes and surpasses all understanding, that guards our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. Father, that we will see a better hope and a better future. Thank you, Lord, that we can give you the glory. And like Lazarus, that I will speak over everyone that you will not die. This will not result in death, but that your life and your circumstances will be for the greater glory of God and that you will be glorified through each and everyone's life. We honor you. We say thank you that you closed, Father, and that you, you hold us in the palms of your hands. And Father, that we will just in this week experience now, now today, and in this week, how close you are and how you work, even when we seem like you're not working. If it seems like you're far off, help us to see the unseen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you be blessed and may you from now on see differently, look differently, and may you be enabled to see the unseen. Be blessed. We love you. Amen.